over again, uh, we meet again I guess. So, we were discussing the concepts related to equilibrium in our last class, right. So, first we will talk about or review those aspects and then take a holistic view of what we have discussed so far because now we are going to move on to another major topic or one of the other fundamentals that we are going to discuss about and which is the kinetics, right. So, first let us look at what we have discussed in yesterday's class for now I guess, yes. So, I believe we were trying to solve, right, we are trying to solve for systems at equilibrium, right. I mean I wanted to know what are the concentrations of various compounds at equilibrium and what are the equations that I can use? I can use uh, mass balance if applicable or depending on the scenario. I can also use charge balance, right. More or less what does this mean? The concentration equivalents of all the cations will be equal to the concentration equivalents of all the anions, right. But rarely will you have a complete uh, or you know uh, comprehensive knowledge about all the cations and the anions. So, this has limited applications I guess, but in general charge balance is always followed, right. And then we obviously looked at equilibrium equations. equations. But as we noticed in the last few uh, classes or couple of classes anyway, uh, we are still missing a few equations to be able to solve for our unknowns. So, what is this set of equations I guess? So, in this particular context we introduced a component balance, component balance right. So, what does that mean I guess? Uh, we are going to introduce a concept of uh, a building block. building block. So, this can be hypothetical, can be, need not be though. Right. And what do we end up doing I guess? Let us review the process. Uh, so, we look at or list the species and what are species? These are the actual compounds that exist in the solution at equilibrium, right. And depending upon the species, so let us take an example I guess here, let us take uh, CH3 COOH dissociating into its conjugate base, right. It dissociates by giving out its proton here. So, I will approximate this by saying HAC, acetic acid, state ion and H plus, right. So, we, uh, what are the species here? Uh, we know that we will have HAC and AC minus and we will also have H plus. Whenever we have H plus, we will also have OH minus. Obviously, water is always a species, but we are not going to list that I guess, right. And what next? So, we need to choose components and how do we choose these components? We choose them such that you know the minimum possible number or combination would be able to give us all the relevant species. So, thumb rules we always choose H plus or we try to rather and choose the most deportinated form of the particular acid and which in this case is the acetate ion, right. And then I believe we said for formation equations. So, I am going to skip that for now, right. How are you going to form the relevant uh, species from the various components? And then from the formation equations, you will be able to write the tableau or come up with the tableau. And what is this tableau about? It gives us an idea about the component balance. So, here we are going to do that, I guess, H plus and AC minus, the components there, and all the species here, HAC, AC minus. H plus and OH minus, right. How many H plus do I need to form HAC? 1, 0, 1 and minus 1. And why is OH minus uh, a negative minus H plus? Because it is H2O minus H plus is equal to OH minus, right. So, again AC minus 1, 1, 0 and 0. And if I know uh, based on what it is or what is the initial solution that is uh, leading to uh, or the source of all these components, we can that equate that here. So, next up I will need to write my equilibrium equations, equilibrium equations, right. 
And in this case, I guess we have two equilibrium equations. One is the acid dissociation constant here, Ka1 equal to activity of AC minus or a state ion into activity of H plus, right, by activity of HAC. So, this is the acid dissociation constant. Anyway, we are going to discuss this in greater detail later on, but you know, uh, for now, please bear with me. So, obviously, we can in dilute solutions, we can approximate this by the concentrations or relevant concentrations, right. So, activities we are now approximating them by the concentrations, right. And the other one would be the water dissociation H plus and OH minus by activity of H2O and obviously activity of H2O is going to be 1 and I am going to approximate them by the concentrations. Right, but still we have only two equations here, right, Ka1, Ka2 the equilibrium equations and we have four unknowns here as you see in the species, right. So, what do we need to do? We need to come up with two additional equations, two additional equations, what are those do, right and that you will use the component balance. So, if you look at this, I am going to balance the components and whatever the transformations within the system or between the species, the total components are going to stay the same. So, that is the concept here with respect to component balance. So, H total equal to what now? Concentration of HAC plus concentration of H plus minus concentration of OH minus, right. And what about estate total? Total estate I guess. So, estate here looks like is only going to be either in HAC or AC minus. And if you know what the source of these compounds is, you can have that here. And you have now two additional equations. So, you have four equations, four unknowns and you can solve for that according, right. So, with the, this particular aspect of component balance, uh, we can now calculate you know what are the equilibrium concentrations of any compounds let us see right given the relevant uh, conditions. So, this always works. So, out there either uh, from different instructors or from let us say nowadays uh, internet is uh, I guess popular with people right. But anyway, uh, so there might be multiple ways out there to solve various uh, problems, but one aspect or one way anyway that would never fail is the component balance equation a generic approach that always works right. And here we are going to use that throughout the class that is the uh, fundamental here or the building block here for our class I guess, right. So, we are done with equilibrium for now. So, we are going to move on to the next major topic which is kinetics, but we are very briefly going to talk about or look at what we have discussed so far in the class, right. So, we am going to look at you know equilibrium now, right. So, again uh, we dis divide our class into equilibrium and kinetics right and then we are at the latter stage of our classes going to look at the applications of these two aspects you know uh, with respect to the most commonly used or you know uh, reactions or most commonly uh, what we say the reactions that we come across as environmental engineers in general. So, acid base and then complex formation or complexes let us say formation of complexes, precipitation and dissolution and more importantly the redox reactions, the oxidation and reduction reactions, right. So, this is what we have for the later part of the class. So, thus far we have been talking about the fundamentals here related to the equilibrium, right. So, what have we discussed thus far let us see. I believe we mentioned that it is driven by thermodynamics, right and thermodynamics again we need to look at the delta G values that is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And then we looked at uh, feasibility of this particular or a particular reaction, right. Uh, when it is negative, we see that it is feasible, when it is positive, not feasible, or the reverse reaction is feasible, and when it is 0, it is at equilibrium. So, obviously, for visualization purposes, we looked at you know state G1 and state G2. So, uh, higher energy state, right. So, it can fall down the ladder to G2, and delta G here is. G2 minus G1 and as you can see that here that is negative and that can go through though, but if it is inverse though obviously it is going to be uh, not feasible there. For example, if it is G2 and G1, G1 cannot move up the ladder to G1, so this would not happen, but G2 can fall down the ladder to G1, right. Again that is what we say when delta G is positive. 
Anyway, and then we looked at how enthalpy affects delta G, how entropy or degree of disorder affects uh, the Gibbs uh, change in Gibbs energy and so on, right. And then I believe we looked at the concept of chemical potential for a particular compound and that is equal to the molar Gibbs energy of the compound. So, chemical potential what is that I guess a potential for chemical uh, gives us an idea right about the potential for a compound to react chemical potential you know it is similar to saying potential of a particular person or a particular uh, company or such here I guess right. I am just drawing natural uh, or simpler uh, corollaries here right chemical potential here. So, greater the potential the greater the greater the chemical potential greater the potential for the compound to react and then fall down to a lower chemical potential yes that is something we came across there. And then I believe we applied the uh, what do we say G systems or came across uh, calculating the Gibbs energy of system and I believe what do we have there so N i mu i N i is the number of moles of particular compound or component mu i is the chemical potential of that particular component also that is similar obviously to Ni Gi bar summation of Ni and Gi bar product I guess right. And so then we uh, looked at applying that to reactions and I believe we looked at you know what is the change going to be and so on and I believe we came across for a generic reaction V i mu i of the products minus of the reactants this is what we came across and obviously uh, what is this particular set of variables here I guess or variable here or the differential here. So, how does the Gibbs energy of the system change with a small change in the uh, reaction or when the reaction has gone through a small extent let us say. So, that is nothing but obviously delta G right. So, obviously when we drew the particular figure here and we looked at one particular schematic this is the G of the system. So, when the slope or this particular variable dg by dxz is negative we see that the reaction is feasible as in it can fall down from a higher energy state to a lower energy state right. So, anyway the uh, slope is going to be negative here and when it is equal to 0 when the slope is equal to 0 we see that it is at equilibrium and again when it is positive we see that it cannot move up the ladder. So, not feasible here not feasible feasible here and so on and I believe this is what we looked at and what else did we look at I guess. Then we started looking at how to calculate uh, delta G values at I believe standard conditions and then non-standard conditions right. So, standard conditions we define them as temperature equal to 25 degrees centigrade and what else please pressure equal to 1 bar and we came across a new uh, what we say term called the activity of the compound or component and we said activity should be equal to 1 if it is at standard conditions right. Activity I guess at that time we were approximating it by concentration right and it gives us an idea about the ability of the particular compound to react right. And so, we came across this and I think we mentioned that uh, we can you look at the elements you know leading to formation of particular compound right. And then we define the Gibbs energy of formation of these elements as equal to 0 this is our reference. So, from that we can come up with or measure the Gibbs energy of formation of the compounds at standard state we can measure this right and with these you can come up with any other reactions or delta G values for any other reactions that you want to and this is what we looked at in that particular standard conditions right. And then we looked at standard conditions as in what would happen to the system or how would the system change with respect to the delta G calculations and such if the activity is not equal to 1 which is what you would observe if it is not equal to 1 or if temperature is not equal to 25 degrees centigrade and pressure is not equal to 1 bar right. This is what we uh, looked at. So, with respect to activity not equal to 1 there are two aspects one is the reactants themselves and the other is the non reactants. So, in general we mentioned that two molecules they collide you know right and then the reaction takes place. So, the higher the number of uh, uh, what do we say the reactants or the concentration of the reactants the greater the possibility for collision and thus the greater the uh, feasibility of the reaction. Again when you have charged species which is what you would see or expect in your solution or you have uh, multiple non reactants that are charged and if the ionic strength is high that can have a detrimental effect on the interactions between the two relevant compounds or 3 or 4 right. So, that is why we looked at activity I guess right and what did we define activity as activity of a particular component or compound is equal to its activity coefficient 
time is normalized uh, what do we say uh, what is this now the uh, dimensionless concentration of that particular compound I guess right. So, for that particular aspect we will have different particular equations for uh, activity coefficient almost all of them are function of I and charge what is I? I is the ionic strength right and higher the ionic strength uh, the lower the uh, gamma I and thus the lower the activity of the particular compound that is obvious I guess the higher the concentration of the non reactants that are going to interfere with your reactants let us say the lower is going to be their ability to uh, react let us say. So, that is what we have here that was the take home message there right and obviously again we define how to what are the units we need to look at with respect to the concentration of I here and I believe for aqueous phase we said we need to use molar right not molar here and if you use molar there will be an error of what I think 3 percent here in this case. So, aqueous phase and then gaseous phase we said it is going to be what now partial pressure and in the liquid phase and in the solid phase it is going to be mole fraction of that particular component. So, that is how we define that right. So, what does this mean as in if I have a equilibrium co coefficient equal to activity of this thing activity of this thing and so on right and I need to write that write down the uh, concentrations here what am I going to do if I have an aqueous phase here I am going to use molar concentration if I have a gaseous component here I am going to use the partial pressure here right. So, that is what uh, more or less it translates into and then we started looking at what are the effects of uh, temperature not being equal to 25 degrees centigrade right. I think we looked at the Van Hoff equation and I think we ha looked at the relevant aspects in general in general right for especially with respect to the exothermic reaction this is what we looked at I guess the example we are not going to go into that in detail now in general the greater the uh, what do we say uh, temperature the greater the kinetic energy of the molecules and greater the chances for collision and chances for the reaction going through that is in the general case. But we looked at the relevant equation for k t by k t naught for the relevant scenarios and we looked at them right and then we also looked at what would be the case when pressure is not equal to 1 bar or the standard conditions and then we looked at the relevant aspects again k at p pressure and k at the p naught standard and how that varies and in general you know that let us say if this is the current pressure of 1 bar and let us say now you are applying twice the pressure let us say right. So, this is going to resist or the higher pressure higher the pressure the greater the resistance to change in volume right. So, whenever the delta V needs to increase so if you are you increasing the pressure that will be to the detriment of your reaction because you obviously need not detriment I guess the equilibrium coefficient is going to shift towards the left yes and this is what we discussed in the class. So, again we are not going to go into that in greater detail right. So, I believe the last aspect then we end up covering I believe was looking at the component balance I believe right. And before that we also looked at uh, phase equilibrium, phase equilibrium right. So, a particular compound let us say compound A uh, if it is in particular uh, phase 1 uh, as in gaseous or liquid and gas right it will equilibrate between these two phases now. So, 1 mole in gas and 2 moles in liquid and so on and so we came up with uh, relevant relationships and I think one for this particular case is the Henry's constant right that gives us the relationship between concentration in the gaseous phase and concentration in the liquid phase or in general the aqueous phase here I guess right. And keep in mind that the units uh, of Henry's constant can be different. So, actually if someone defines the units in a different way you can even have an inverse of this particular fraction here right. So, you just need to look at the units before you come up with your particular term or look at your particular uh, units of your particular uh, individual variables here right. So, it can be atmosphere per mole or mole, uh, moles per uh, what do we say liter right this is one particular combination of units for Henry's constant and there can be uh, multiple other uh, equations. So, same case we looked at gas liquid 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 and fluid and solid uh, what do we say phase equilibrium and we looked at how it goes about and such right and we looked at a generic example and then we came across the component balance which we discussed today right. So, anyway now we are going to move on to the next major topic which is the uh, kinetics right and kinetics what does that give an idea about I guess it gives us an idea about how fast is the process or the chemical process right how fast is it 
and as we talked about it is a characteristic, it is not a state obviously it is a characteristic of your particular process. So, right usually we apply them to reactions at a micro scale and why do you need information about kinetics let us say right. For example, let us say you have an activated sludge process here I mean I am poor what do we say very poor with respect to drawing figures here. So, you should excuse me I guess right. So, let us say you have an activated sludge process here right and with the return here and so on and this is where you have your uh, reactions occurring here let us say. Uh, so, let us say you want to uh, you conducted the test in your uh, lab let us say right and you want to obviously scale this up. So, what do you need to look at though you need to look at the relevant kinetics right the kinetics of a particular compound let us say now most people are looking at emerging contaminants or let us say talk about a pharmaceutical compound let us say right a pharmaceutical compound that is entering here and you want to see what how fast or if any is your particular compound being degraded in your activated sludge process right. So, you will conduct the relevant lab tests after regression you can come up with the kinetics and then you can use that to uh, scale up your particular model later on right and apply that to your engineered systems too yes. So, with respect to terminology we usually come across rate rate of a reaction right and we in general we will use uh, two aspects or mostly one, but we will discuss two here overall rate and volumetric rate right. And overall rate as it indicates I guess is just amount of the substance degraded or formed per time or change in amount of that particular compound per time right. But here you know uh, let us say if we apply this to this ASP let us say we are not talking about uh, with respect to particular volume though right. But that is going to create issues if not in ASP let us say if you have a river let us say right. You are dumping a compound here the river is flowing in this direction right. Uh, let me uh, draw a better figure here right. So, we have a river flowing through right and let us say at Haridwar uh, somebody is dumping uh, industrial waste and I am at Rurki here and I want to see the effects of this particular uh, compound here by uh, when it reaches me at uh, Rurki right. So, for here though as we see the reactions are occurring throughout the course of the uh, river uh, you will have what do we say obviously the transport mechanisms advection and uh, what do we say diffusion, but obviously you are going to have either rate of formation or uh, loss of your compound probably loss and I want to be able to look at that. So, if I look at the overall rate that will give me a misleading picture or incomplete picture right. So, what do I usually go for I go for a volumetric rate and that is nothing but change in amount of your substance per volume per time right. So, that is what you would see here. The, so, in general this is what we are going to use volumetric rate throughout the uh, course of our class yes and that is amount of your substance uh, that is uh, transformed uh, per volume of your particular uh, system per time let us say right. And in general uh, next aspect is going to be the sequential reactions. So, let us say if I have a compound A in solution right it can transform into multiple ways right in the real world it can either go or degrade. Uh, through parallel reactions to B and C right here A and A going to B and A going to C are parallel reactions right. So, here you can have parallel reactions at the same time you can have a series of uh, a series reactions pardon me a series reactions right. So, we are going to discuss these two aspects in greater detail and why. So, for example, let us say if I am now looking at this particular case with respect to uh, uh, what do we say A uh, degrading uh, via two reactions and those two are parallel reactions A going to B and A going to C are parallel reactions. So, let us say if you want to model this right and you are going to look at let us say for example, you know that A going to B is remarkably faster than A going to C you know let us say 1000 times faster in magnitude let us say if the rate constant we are going to talk about what rate constant is later on for now think of it as a metric that will give us an idea about how fast the reaction is or about the kinetics of the reaction. So, again we are talking about a new term it is a rate constant and this is a small k I guess right a rate constant. So, let us say rate constant of A going to B k 1 is far greater than 
A going to C, right? So then I can uh, neglect A going to C and just say it's just A going to B, right? To simplify my set of process. And then the next aspect is going to be the series reactions, right? When A goes to D goes to E, right? And in this case, let's say what am I concerned with? For example, think of this. Let's say as I go from let's say Roorkee uh, to Delhi, let's say, right? And assuming that you know this is a hypothetical case in India, I guess, right? Uh, that uh, free of traffic, a nice uh, what do we say? Uh, uh, what do we say? Highways here, right? What do I need to look at though? I need to look at where I have the major population clusters. Let's say I think I come across Modinagar and Ghaziabad. And at this particular point in uh, space, right, I am going to be stuck in traffic half an hour or one hour, right. So, if I am looking at the rate of my particular travel from uh, Roorkee to Delhi, what defines my in general uh, travel now, right. The, at that particular point in time or the rate limiting step, right. So, this is a new term that we have in your series reactions. You have a rate limiting step. And the analogy we are looking at is I travel from Roorkee to Delhi, I hit traffic in Ghaziabad or Modinagar and here the traffic piles up here for many uh, what do we say kilometers or so, right. So here irrespective of the rate at which I come here or here, uh, the crucial aspect that I am concerned with is the rate at this particular point in space. So similarly in reactions let us say I can have A going to B going to C going to D and so on. But if let us say C or B going to C is very slow, you are going to have a lot of accumulation of compound B, right. So you can say that A going to B goes to C, why D I guess, why is that? Because B to C and then uh, pardon me, C to D is a fast reaction let us say. So I can approximate this particular series reaction by saying it is A goes to B goes to D. So in general the rate limiting step is when you have accumulation of that particular compound or the reactant you will observe accumulation of your reactant, right. That is the rate limiting step here. And in this case, the reactant here is going to be B as that is accumulating because B going to C is very slow, right. That is what you of your reactant. Think of that as accumulating at that particular traffic uh, jam or junction here in your travel case, I guess, right. So, I believe I have a set of uh, uh, what do we say uh, uh, graphs to look at. But I believe we are uh, running out of time, so we will uh, discuss this in next class and for that uh, for today's session that is it from me I guess.